Oh, waiting. So, um, so the, there's like they, this is a common term, but it's also so microscopic. They're making the distinction between microscopic, which is like single cellular recording, and macroscopic, which is fMRI type uh, things, and then mesoscopic is in between. Uh, well, let's see. And so uh, they're specifically in this case. Um, uh, they're making the point that a lot of this all has to do with everything we talk about in terms of bridge cells, place cells, object vector cells, and so on. And they're saying, okay, a lot of this work has been done at the single cellular recording level, and so now there's a bunch of literature about the fMRI level. But we, these researchers, are intracortical EEG recorders, meaning it's under the skull. Intracortical EEG is measuring what local field potentials, not individual cells, but um, voltage potentials of group, small groups of cells. And they're actually, the resolution that they're recording from in, these, uh, in their world is getting close, it's very, uh, starting to overlap with fMRI, so several hundred microns, or you know, part of a, a millimeter. And fMRI is getting down there, but of course, with the EEG, what you get is you get this high temporal resolution, very it's, fast. It's extracellular, so you have to do spike sorting. You have to do what? Right? Spike sorting? There's no, there's uh, no, there's, there's you don't no get spikes spike. because you get like a. It's just a, a feel. It's just like an electrical yeah. feel. Yeah. LFP can do can detect spikes through spike, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, LFP. Uh, oh. If you have probes, yes. I don't know if they're. Well, probes. these are. They, they're talking about some of these are like just sort of surface implanted, like right instead of going through the skull, they're right on the brain. Oh, so a human is going under surgery, yeah. or a monkey. Um, they have a few that are actually implanted, but they're not doing any single spikes. Though. It's just all local field potential, like they're doing frequencies and waves. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying, hey, we can detect all these same things too uh, using these approaches. Um, so is this working now? Can I yeah, I and mean, then you should be able to duplicate to it now. Uh, I still am not doing that. Why? No, so LFP is a. Usually, oh, it's, a, it's a slightly more general measure, and it, you can't yeah. often tell oh. inhibitory from excitatory yeah. cells, so you have to be really careful. Okay, power you don't think so that it's more inhibitory. Yeah. It could be actually more inhibitory activity. Okay. Uh, uh, so, why is this? Oh, 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 this is, a, this is a class of papers where I would say, when you read this paper, I don't get a lot of new big ideas. Um, but what it is, is one of these papers that's like a Rosetta Stone. It ties together all these different ideas. In some sense, it's a, a wonderful review paper. That it goes to oh, pretty much everything that we've ever talked about with big cells, play cells, body directors, cells, boundaries, and head directions, and so on. It says, oh, who are the people who discovered these properties over here? And then in cellular, in the single cellular, these are how people have done MRI. And we are now talking about these frequencies and how these frequencies can be used to explain the same thing. So there's, when I go through the paper sometimes, I, I see, oh, what are the new ideas? But also I find out, well, what are the papers, what are the references I want to read? And this is one of those papers where I had like at least 20 references that I wanted to read. It was less that, less that this paper introduced major new ideas. It was more like, oh my God, this ties it all together. And these are all these papers, these little tidbits that are in this paper that, um, that makes me want to read all these references. So it's, it's a little bit depressing because you feel like I need to spend at least two days going through these references. But it's a good tutorial. They, they, for example, so you get the basic idea of what this is about, right? It's about you know measuring frequencies. And they even start off with like, here's all the different frequencies in the right. Delta frequencies, one to four hertz, theta, four to eight, alpha, eight to three, beta, thirteen to thirty, gamma low, gamma high. They talk about how these frequencies, basically mostly about the theta and gamma frequencies, relate to uh, each other and they relate to these various processes that we all that we almost always exclusively talk about with bridge cells, place cells, and final cortex, hippocampus, things like that. And then they go through little tutorials explaining what all the different phrases mean um, um, and about these things. So this little box here is basically explaining what this is all about. Um, I'm not going to go through the text here in detail. Um, they also go in, 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 I didn't read this, this is sort of a tutorial on how people believe theta oscillations come about, so this is very low level physiology. 
the different theories of how the oscillations are derived, which is probably useful, but I didn't have time to read that yet. Um, then uh, the, you can just by looking at the, the figures, you get a sense. This is sort of like this, this sort of omnibus chart saying, hey, when we look at the single cellular level, these are the kind of things you get in these papers. What are they? These are grid cells. These are you know, the vector, object vector cells and so on. And then here's how people get it at the fMRI. These are experiments you can refer to in the fMRI. The, the exact same equivalents of place cells, order cells, and grid cells, place cells, order cells, grid cells. And now here's how we're getting this stuff on the net with, with these oscillations and these are different figures from various papers. So they're trying to say, like, we get to play in this, this ballpark too. Um, so they can kind of make that sort of connection there. Wait, so do they put the, the, the fMRI hexadirectional signal, do they put that in macroscopic? Or yes, okay. that's macroscopic. Then they have an entire section devoted to, um, uh, where is that? Did I skip over me? The entire section, oh, dedicated to this issue of why do we see the hexadirectional activities? Uh, and we've talked about this a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Where did this come from? What are the different theories? So here they're saying, you know, here's a different use of like in the microscopic world of you know single grid cells. And when you go in one direction, you have to go longer before you get to repeat. When you go in the shorter direction, you go this way. Why is it we see uh, uh, less uh, bold activity when we go this direction versus this direction? What are the theories for that? Um, and so you know they're, they're touching on all these topics. What they're trying to show is that. These different techniques can tease apart the same principles in different sort of different directions, and they really need to be compatible with one another. Um, and they're trying to make this connection that we need to do all this. Um, and then, uh, yeah, what else? I, to do? I think I skipped one of the figures here. This figure. Um, Oh, this is this was just a tutorial or explanation about the bold signal and spiking activity, which is a perennial topic. It's been around for decades. Uh, but you know, what can we confer from the bold signal and from RI about spiking and so on? So again, this is not really new information. This is like a review of all these different topics. Um, now, it wasn't it wasn't what was new for me was just thinking about how the. They had a lot of data about the, the theta signal and the delta, uh, the theta and the gamma frequencies, and how they correlate with behaviors in movements and so on. And, and I have tons of things highlighted here, and I'm not going to go through them. Um, but uh, it's 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 very revealing that it, by reading these references, I think we'll learn more about the topics we're kind of stuck on here. But uh, just some basic ideas, such as. Uh, Um, uh, they need some conclusions of it that were interesting. I'm going to start highlighting this actually. I have so much highlighted that this is pretty possible. Just a couple things that just caught my attention here. Here is a, um, let's just look at. Uh, uh, Behaviors is supported in this paper. 
So you know, there's a lot of evidence for that. So I felt like, oh, this, is, this paper sort of ties together a whole bunch of things we've talked about using new techniques we haven't discussed, but not really introducing any new ideas. Um, just more evidence and more sort of precise uh, definitions between these different techniques and different papers. And so it's just, it's just a, if someone said to me, I want to learn all about this field of play cells and grid cells and so on, I might actually point to this paper first and say, read this first, and then go follow all these links. Um, and you can, and, and you get a good, you take days to do that, but you get a good education. So um, that's my task. I want to go and uh, read a lot of these. There's a lot of clever little points in here that, you know, I say, oh, I want to read that paper. Oh, I want to read that paper. Maybe there's a tip of knowledge in there. And I, as I said, I have over 20 of the references, which is pretty unusual for a paper. Um, if I have 20 references, I feel like, oh, I have to read that. Um, so I thought this was a really cool paper. Um, and um, and that's my summary. Is there anything specific about the oscillation stuff that, that popped out? Or? Yeah, again, it's all stuff we've heard about before, but it, it sort of placed it in a, a broader context has made it seem more clear. Right. They talk about phase recession, they talk about you know frequency. There's all stuff in here that I've never seen before about frequency and both frequency and power of the data cycle related to speed of movement and um, and scale, um, and and so which is very consistent with the concept of the thalamus doing that in the cortex. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question or not. Um, again, it was more. It was just like I didn't come across any new big ideas, but it sort of clarified a lot of the other things. It was the one place you could put all these disparate ideas in sort of a cohesive whole. As oh, uh, it makes sense now. And, I didn't realize the connections between these and things like that. Um, but I do feel if I follow all these links, um, in the context of this paper, I will discover new ideas uh, or new evidence supporting or, or um, contrary to our theories. Um, Just answer this call. Okay. Okay. So that's pretty much it for, for me on this paper. Uh, and I said, anyone else has any questions about it? Did you mention any higher frequency um, EEG than a of 80 plus? Is that kind of the top of their reporting range? Uh, well, they just talked about gamma and they talked about theta primarily. And um, uh, and it was interesting because I thought, it, they, they, for example, they said this, I'm not answering your question directly. They talked about theta being 4 to 8, but they said, oh, but in humans, it's often lower than that. In humans, it's 1 to 4 hertz. I'm like, well, <laughs> But in, but in you know, rats, it's 4 to 8. Um, so I wasn't paying too much attention to the actual frequencies when I read through this. Maybe and you're asking me about an actual frequency. I just wondering, that was, uh, that was talked recently from Bob Knight's lab, and they're doing some really interesting work with uh, showing how much information is contained in the super high frequency signal. How much it could be contained? Or is in, and, 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 and what, in what parts of the brain? They're doing auditory tests, verbal production tests, and they're watching signals move back and forth between both fMRI and these high frequency recordings. Uh -huh. So you're doing audio processing and then producing a response. Uh -huh. but it, but it seems like this is. I didn't talk about it. You know, mostly I think the way they view these things, I have this impression, is they localize where the, where the frequency is, um, you know, some part of the, like, the entorhinal cortex or whatever, and that's how the, and then they say, okay, anything that happens there is, is gonna be in this category, as opposed to, it's more like they're, they're looking for where, where these frequencies are, very locally localized, and that's the thing they're more focused on as opposed to the, um, um, looking at it a different way. So the, they didn't say, oh, let's talk about now the high frequency stuff, it was more like, okay, let's talk about theta here and gamma here and theta here and gamma here. Um, and, and although they did talk about certain frequencies at different points, I, was like, I, don't, I wasn't really paying attention to that. Um, so, um, and he, right here they're saying like, uh, both human and monkey neurotrophic of high gamma, greater than 80 hertz power, being particularly tightly correlated with spiking activity in some study of mean ion. So they, hear, they, they mentioned these frequencies, but I didn't really pay attention to them. We're going to discuss this now, but I'd be curious at some point to hear what the working model is here in terms of oscillations, just how we interpret them. Is this long-range communication? I mean, this uh, well, we haven't really had uh, a, a solid theory about it uh, in our work, and we've had, but we've recently started thinking about how it could correlate. Uh, I mean, I can take it offline, give you a little sure. introduction yeah. to that. Um, 
it, in two, it's been in two basic areas. One is it, uh, os the different, like the different phases of certain oscillations appear to be related to learning and inference, and so that solves some of our learning inference problems so that you were you want to do both simultaneously. Looks like you might actually have two different cell populations that are oscillating back and forth between learning and inference. Yeah. And um, the other area that I just briefly mentioned is the, the idea of um, these oscillations between the thalamus and the cortex, which are prevalent and well studied but have no theoretical sort of theory behind them. And um, um, an idea that I'm not sure if I completely generated myself or got from someplace I don't remember, but I've been running with, is the idea that that frequency is, uh, uh, there's some models of grid cells which are based on the, the progression of the, the, the bump in the grid cells is based on an oscillatory frequency. And, uh, and that oscillatory frequency represents the rate of movement. Mm -hmm. That's one of the two major classes of grid cells. And so the, the hypothesis that that I've been working on recently, which I'm pretty excited about, is that this frequency of oscillation between cortex and thalamus is, is, is essentially, um, it's controlling scale, but it can, it's gonna control scale of um, distance and size, which are related. So if I'm gonna move my eye from your eye to eye, how much I'm moving depends on how far away you are. So by the actual frequency, we encode your distance, and it would actually encode how much a movement, when I move, how far does it move? And so the whole idea that there's this constant scale factor going on in the, between the cortex and the thalamus, as you tend to think, the different distances. Mm -hmm. So that's the other, um, uh, and that, that's directly tied into the grid cells in the new cortex. That's that other idea. I think you and I did a record. We did a little recording on that, didn't we? Didn't yeah, we did a podcast about the thalamus. And yeah, so you can actually listen to that. That's probably better because now we're more. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to... Um, uh, I'll do one, one just tiny addition on, on this paper. I, I read part of it because I was curious to know on their theories of um, on when, when they lay out the reasons why the hex directional signal for grid cells might be there. Um, one, one thing, I talked to one of the authors of this paper and, um, and one thing that they don't say in this paper because you wouldn't want to say in a paper because it might be overruled. So, uh, is uh, yeah, it, it might it might it might not age well if you say this. One of those theories is that conjunctive grid head direction cells are the source for all of this. Um, the idea that there are certain directions where you get more of these conjunctive cells. I think that's yeah, in, I think that's in here. Uh, no, 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 I'm I'm laying out the foundation. Oh, for what oh, I'm oh okay. Uh, that was in the paper. So. Um, the, the some a bit of information that's hard to get that is hard to learn unless you talk to people is um, multiple labs have had trouble replicating that result. Uh -huh. uh, multiple labs have had trouble um, replicate, replicating the um, the the idea that these conjunctive head direction uh, grid cells are non evenly distributed. The idea that they're kind of at the peaks of a, of a hexagon or whatever. Yeah. Um, multiple people have tried to find that and failed. Uh, and and basically that that's um, anyway, that, that's just one of those theories um, is proving not probably not to be correct. But but who knows? Maybe another lab will successfully. So they it. mentioned that idea in here, I think. Right? They, they mentioned the idea, but they didn't they didn't mention that labs have tried to. They didn't have the other. But why would why would that be considered bad form to put that in a paper? I mean, well, it seems an important important point to mention. They, they can't <laughs> because people have maybe they haven't published on. They that can't or? really point to a specific study. Uh, they can't point to. A non-replication study. Oh, because people have tried, but they haven't published the right. failure. Right? Basically, yeah, I, so I think the, people the, haven't put effort into publishing the. I they said didn't like, oh, well, you, you and I talked about it, and we just got, and I said we couldn't find it, but we didn't really write it up, so I can't reference it or yeah. cite it. That yeah, kind of thing. basically. Yeah, yeah. I didn't actually read that in detail here. I think it's like, it's just so much. This is like this paper, as I said, I realized like, I'd have to spend days going through this, all the references and the links and following all the arguments. Uh, but anyway, that's an interesting piece of data. Um, I feel like someone's going to write a paper or two saying, you know, here are the different ways the 60 degree thing could come about, rather than test these like, each hypothesis mm -hmm. and try to rule it yeah. on different things. And that's, um, that was part of the motivation for the Dollar Lab, which is like the fMRI people. And uh, basically, they moved to Norway, to the, where the Moser Lab is, to collaborate in part for that reason. They mm -hmm. wanted to figure out what, where the heck this hexadirectional signals coming from. Like yeah. that was one of their main motivations yeah. for joining forces. Yeah. I mean, our, our work is very complementary to all of this stuff because you know, we obviously put uh, interpretations on these things which they don't mention here at all. 
Um, but this work is very relevant to our work in many ways. So, anyway, okay, that's a good piece of data. All right. Okay, so I guess we'll switch to me. I'll project as well. You're fine. Why are you doing it? I, I did put some notes on the board that I forgot to mention. Just a, a, a couple little tidbits. Like any kind of faster movement of the animal uh, was associated with higher power in the theater and higher frequency in the theater. But that was also true for uh, virtual versus real movement. So if someone just imagining the movie, you know. Uh, I mean, I think we've read that before. Um, uh, I just that maybe that's something I want to mention. Then. Just, there's a lot of that, like, movements associated with the frequency of these things. Uh, okay, um, yeah, I'll start my topic. Um, so I've been um, kind of binging Jeff Hinton papers from 1981. Uh, he, he did a lot of papers in 1981, and a lot of them are just very relevant. They're very similar to, uh, to uh, our theories, to our models of what the cortical column must be doing. Uh, him, him approaching the problem of how do, how would neural networks do object recognition? Uh, and he comes to a lot of the same conclusions. Uh, and in this, uh, so I read these four papers. I'll just show the titles of them. Brent frames of reference mental imagery. Another one's called uh, Shape Representation in Parallel Systems. Parallel systems is a word they use for it. He used to kind of talk about neural networks. It was just how he was saying it at the time. Uh, another Back one. In the parallel distributed processing day for yeah. that meant neural networks. Uh, and then the role of spatial working memory and shape perception. I'll come and I marked it up a little bit. I'll come back and talk about that. And then a parallel computation that assigns canonical object based frames of reference. Uh, so um, there's a lot here, and like I can summarize Should a lot. Should I tell the story behind this? Sure, go ahead. Um, so I sent our frameworks paper to Jeff Hinton uh, prior to. Uh, Submitting a manuscript, I think it was part of this. I said, "Hey, you know, this is similar to what you're doing with uh, with, capsules. Uh, with capsules, and I, you know, maybe he, I just like be aware of it. Maybe you can suggest something. You know, give me some." So he responded right away, um, but with almost no text. I think his email said, "Read this," and it was linked to this paper. And that was it. That was the entire thing. <laughs> I mean, the, I'll I'll show something from this paper later on the board, uh, but I mean, just to. I don't know. I'll, I'll scroll through it and say a couple things. The idea of like objects can kind of be imagined as being like this tree of components. We don't quite say it like this, but the idea that these components are then related by transformations, related by uh, how is this coordinate frame related to this coordinate frame. Uh, but and that's so like exactly our composite object. Yeah, exactly, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. 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 Uh, so these are components of uh, some sort of higher end. Well, he has a yeah, picture. Exactly. You can see the picture. Right? He does that, have a that, picture. That thing right there. I, th I think this figure, the, my one complaint with this paper <laughs> is this figure. Uh, the, just the way it's the way it's combined with the text, it, it should have been a little different. It's, it's confusing to Could you catch it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he calls the he, he refers to this as a crown, and then he talks about how you can also interpret it differently as a zigzag. But I would I don't even want to explain to you what he means there because the figure is just not good at illustrating that. There should it should have been a two part one one that yeah, illustrates. Yeah. The I, I got it though. I remember reading it. I got it. It's like oh okay, it took a few seconds. Yeah. yeah. So like otherwise, this is a great paper with this one complaint. The first figure should have been rearranged a little bit. Uh, so. Um, the one thing I so I think you're saying there was two possible interpretations of that paper, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two different ways you could consider it as a composite yeah. object. So because because he drew in the crown so that you can see the crown, uh, but if you only pay attention to these solid black lines, ignore the crown underneath. Yeah. The point he was making is you can also see kind of a zigzag where this is a surface. This there's this little rectangle right here is a surface. Uh, like, like it's like a piece of paper with two folds in it, uh, but it doesn't illustrate this very well. Anyway, we can move on. Yeah, that yeah, but he was, he was pointing out two different interpretations of the same yeah. basic structure would yeah. be compatible. Uh, so I mean, he goes into. I don't have much to say from this paper. Uh, it's it sort of just describes a lot of what we have to say. He has the, his own notation of how um, if you see the. Um, if, if you can see within your viewer-centric reference frame where 
component A is? Like, what is the relationship between like object A and your and your viewer centric frame? And if you have that for object B or or for the parent object, etc., then from that you can uh, derive something that is. Um, you can kind of factor the viewer out of it and get something that is viewer invariant. You can get what is the spatial relation re relationship between A and B. Uh, and he just has his own notation for this, talks about all of this. Um, I'll come back to part of this paper when he talks about mental images a little bit, because um, there, there is a, a nice little idea in here when he talks about mental rotation. Um, but I'm going to come back to this in a, in a few minutes after I talk about the other papers. Um, so in this, the so second- were these papers published? Oh, I guess they were, I guess, this is back, I guess, before there was even word processing. <laughs> you're saying, why does it look like, you know, yeah. so crude? I think it's because it was, that's how people look like. It's so old. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> but these so, are published, right? These are available somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this one, shape, representation, and parallel systems, is really the, the most hardcore of all these papers. He just goes into topic after topic. Um, the first couple pages, I would suspect we would find, you, you would find, like, uh, I don't know if this is relevant. And then, then he gets to the meat of it, and suddenly every part of it's relevant. Uh, so I'll scroll down past this first one where he's talking about early visual processing uh, and instead move on. I'll just find the first thing that I highlighted. Um, shape constancy. What was the first thing? Oh, uh, <laughs> so uh, a few people in the room know that many, many times I have driven, I've drawn something on the board which Jeff calls the flux capacitor uh, th that involves a population of cells representing some kind of transformation between two other populations and causing kind of a routing between them. And then there needs to be some mechanism for that. And there needs to be some notation introduced to represent that. And then I found Jeff Hinton did the same exact thing in 1981. Uh, so <laughs> uh, basically, the, you're not the only person to have come to that realization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, like, it's still so It's like a meme in, in deep learning. You think of something new, yeah. and oh, Jeff's done it. You know, yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he really has. He really has. Yeah. 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 Some people claim they've done these things. Yeah. Names, I, I, but, um, but he really has. It's amazing, actually. Yeah. And part of what's, I don't know, part of what's funny is, of course we were going to come to the same conclusion that you want like you know transformations between reference frames but the the idea that you need a notation to represent that and it should look like this uh, is <laughs> just really funny but you know it's funny it, it's of course in hindsight it's obvious but yeah. coming up through the neuroscience world yeah. it wasn't obvious to anybody and and only recently with the whole grid cell play cell stuff that people started talking about reference frames and, um, but you know the long long history of neocortical research no one talked about it ever and not obvious, of course it's obvious, but boy, we all miss it. Yeah. Um, anyway, so kudos to Jeff Hinton. <laughs> 36, eight years earlier. So um, there, here I'll just show, it's on the theme of just showing parallels, things where like, hey, he talked about a lot of similar stuff. I'll just real quick show you in this other paper. I'll come back to it and talk about it more thoroughly. But he has this section called Perception Through a Peephole, uh, where he talks about essentially moving a straw around and seeing an image and, and building up over that's, time. That's why, that's why yeah. you, you're, no, you're he, the function of the function. I mean, it's a straw. Yeah. He doesn't use the word straw. He talks about peepholes. <laughs> but, but it's the same kind of thing. Uh, I'll come back and talk about that a little more, but just since we were already talking about that, about uh, comments. Occurrences. Yeah. So um, another thing that we've talked about a little bit uh, that gets to something I've been talking about lately. Uh, I'll just read this text. Um, uh, he's he's connecting this to Gestalt uh, psychology, uh, and he in interprets it a little bit differently to what he thinks is going to be true with these uh, neural network models of object recognition. So when we attend to a whole, we do not see its parts as wholes because the representation of the whole does not in any way involve or require the representation of the parts as wholes. That might be a little confusing, the second, second sense is better. Um, when a part is seen as a constituent of a larger whole, it is given a quite different internal representation from the one it has when it's seen as a whole in its own right. Is, is that how you spell right? Or R-I-T-E? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. Right. Yeah. that's how you say it right? That's, yeah. Wow, I just learned that. Uh, so, um, I've been thinking lately about the topic of um, 
compositional objects and recognizing like higher level objects without having to drill down to like its lowest level components. Uh, and um, he shows a, a picture here that I think is a useful example in this next page. Um, so I'll, I'll, maybe the next page. No, nope, I'm in the wrong paper. This is in the next paper. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll kind of go through these papers like a tree. So uh, we'll, I'll come back to that one. Um, so the example he uses to, to illustrate this um, is when you first when you first see this in passing, you probably just see a, a messy face. Uh, then you look closer and realize that. Wait, no, it's a face made up of fruit. Uh, it's a banana and a pair of watermelon and apples. Um, and um, the case he makes is that when you see this, you're not building up from the fruit to the face. You're, you're kind of, um, you're, you're, when you see it from the top, when you see the full thing, you, you see the face. Um, and then you can attend to the individual pieces and suddenly you see the fruit. Um, but there's something nice there. It's a, it's a good illustrative, illustrative example of how perceiving a whole versus perceiving the parts, uh, as, you, as you attend to one of these and attend to another, uh, it, it's something different is going on there. And well, yeah, it, it, yeah, right. yeah but, uh, it's, it's kind of, in some ways, it's making the point that the representation of this object, we're not representing as a composite object of specific things like fruits. We have a relationship between generic things that makes up a face. Um, and oh, by the way, those generic things could be bananas or pears. Yeah. Right? yeah. Have, whereas sometimes when we think about a composite object, the subparts are very specific. Yeah. Uh, whereas here we need a but more it's generic. But it's, it's interesting, it could be both because once I've learned this object. Yeah, like the Nementa cup. Yeah, and once yeah. I've learned this object, I will see it instantly. And I will, part of my knowledge about the object is that there's two apples, a pear, and a banana. Um, so that representation is there as a composite object. Although when I first saw it, I didn't have that representation. It was more some basic mm -hmm. shapes of some sort. Right? Is that my interpreting the, the right way there? Um, is the Palmer uh, the one that had a painting of this like fruit composed face? It was like very high detail. Like, oh, was it the artist who does that stuff? I don't know. I'm not sure what that was a, a study, but I think that that image was used to show that was it prosopagnosia patients, the, those who can't detect faces. We're also not able to detect the face in this like fruit composite. Oh, right. uh, it's not just human faces. So there's uh, something uh, uh, interesting. Hmm. Uh, so I'll come back to the previous paper. Uh, so um, I just want to make I didn't skip anything, did I? Um, yeah, that was what I read before. So um, this is another one that I'll come back to in a second. Um, or it's just a little bit of a subject change. So in this paper, he goes through everything. He goes like, um, I would call this his spatial cooler section. Uh, <laughs> so so in, encoding multiple multi-dimensional features. I will, I, will, I will talk about this now. Um, so like, um, he talks about in the, through the earlier part of the paper, he was using single units for everything. Uh, but then he says. Um, he talks about abandoning uh, the naive idea that each specific feature is represented by activity in exactly one unit. Um, instead, each unit can be more coarsely tuned, tuned so that it is activated by a range of possible features. And the ranges of different units can be made to overlap so that each feature activates many different units. Uh, the representation of a particular feature then becomes a pattern of activity in many units. And similar features are represented by similar patterns of activity. Um, and I'll just you go. added if you added just some sort of uh, notion about sparsity to that and maintaining sparsity, then that is a special point. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> um, if many similar features occur at the same time, their, their coatings may over overlap. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, the value of coarse coding techniques relies on the features being relatively sparse. <laughs> 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 so uh, I'll, co I'll come back to this. Uh, this is my second thing I'll have, I have on the whiteboard. I did not that, see that before that. I made my comment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, Th this he he. Th this is like his spatial cooler section of the paper, uh, in some sense. Um, I'll talk about it a little more. How it's related related to the spatial cooler, but not exactly the same. 
Um, and but there's a second thing I want to bring up before I talk about this more. Uh, now, just to talk through the it's okay. So far, I've been focusing on areas where he came to the same conclusion as us. Um, but in this paper, I thought it was noteworthy. Some something where he says something um, that I would say I, I don't know if he's right. Uh, that, we might agree with him some days, other days we wouldn't. We'll see. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about it here. When he talks about perception through a people, moving the eyes around, building up an image, or, or whatever inference process is going on as you move your eyes around, um, he jumps to the idea that, um, I, I'll read the second part of it. I'll, I'll read his, his um, what he thinks is the answer there of what happens. Um, that might be right, but we'll see. So what is needed is a way of representing where the, pl where the pieces are uh, that is not affected by eye movements or even by movements of the whole person through space. Uh, so we would agree with that. So, well, sort of, y here's where I'm confused. This is a paper on spatial working memory uh, of remember, remembering like what's out there and where is it. Wh where is it? Uh, and he, he but working memory is like a temporary memory. Yes. Yeah. He's specifically talking about not, like, not compositional structure. Right, right. Uh, we would definitely agree with this when it comes to l learning an object. Yeah. Uh, but but he says so. When I was reading this, out, uh, when I was reading his other work, I was like, wait, why is he jumping this this conclusion? That uh, here, I'll just read the sentence. Um, it's just here's where he's he's saying something that I think is plausible, but he says it's very unlikely. Uh, he says it's just as conceivable that as we move our eyes, the internal records of all the previously perceived place pieces are correspondingly altered so that the records always encode where the piece is relative to the current retinal position. But this seems very unlikely. Um, this paper was written before saccadic remapping, it was written before object vector cells, it was written before all these things that actually resemble what he, what he is um, what he's saying. Yeah, but the phrase is, the internal records are, uh, are, are correspondingly altered. Yeah. That seems odd to me. Um, and maybe it's, I'm just getting hung, hung up on the wording there. Um, I mean, when I think about psychotic remapping, for example, it's not like a record is being altered. It's it's more I have a uh, I have this three dimensional map and or some n dimensional map, and I'm moving to a new location. Therefore, I can my inputs are changing, but it's not like I'm I don't believe the idea that I'm moving something. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm altering something. I mean, altering, yeah, you're altering because you're making a prediction based on your movement, but it's not like I have some record over here and I go, go retrieve it out of memory and alter it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so I don't know if I'm, I, I, I don't just mean the internal representation. I, I would say he, um, he, his point of view is that when you look at um, a scene, when you look at anything, um, when, when you look around, what, anything that can be called a scene, like a room, yeah. um, you immediately choose um, a, a a scene based reference frame and you immediately start putting stuff in okay it. Um, and i think it's is that do you read that from that sentence not that sentence throughout the rest of his writing okay, okay. The, this is this, okay. this like, is linked to the rest of his writing um and he never this is the only time he considers the idea that instead maybe what you do is you keep track of like okay there's a chair over there there's a chair over there and as i move around i update those egocentric uh, uh locations of those chairs um, which i would argue object vector cells essentially do oh i see i see uh the internal records a lot of people perceive pieces or cross my own Oh, oh, so it's, oh, I, I didn't read the whole sentence. So he's basically, it, it, what he's saying is encoding is the, the position is changing. I mean, what's, what's being altered is the position. Yeah. Okay, so then I would agree with, uh, I, I would agree with you that that's, we do feel that that's happening. Like, I, I'm not confident, I can't just confidently say he's wrong here, but like, but he at least should have given, I mean, this was 1981, but it, he, he, he could have given more uh, more wording to this possibility because it's it is definitely possible. What it requires, which I don't know if anyone even thought about this back then, but it requires sort of a, a motor-based path integration motor, uh, yes. framework. Right. You know, where where based on your movement, you have a representational position which automatically gets updated based on your movement. Yeah. Um, and you can see, like maybe our intuition about 
neurons, and the brain has changed a lot since back then. Because like this was essentially before most people knew about place cells. Like the place cells took decades to become into the public. When was it? Was in 1980? Really, the early '70s, and then the big paper happened in '78. So wow. technically, it was before, but uh, but place cells took so long to catch on, in part because yeah. like it, they just operated in a different way than people thought neurons operated. Uh, so I can see. I remember that. back in this day, and I can't speak for Hinton himself, but generally everybody in the neural network field paid zero attention to what was going on in neuroscience. Mm -hmm. I mean, none, zero. Um, it, it was just you know we have these point neuron models, and that's all we need to know about. So. It wouldn't be surprised to me if most, well, most, I'm certain most known network researchers back then would never have even heard of place cells. Um, uh, I don't know about your opinion, but so yeah. the excuse for not knowing it. My interpretation of this is that it's uh, it's coming from a place of computational efficiency. He's thinking about you've learned all these uh, positions of objects in a room, and then you have to adjust all of them every time you make a saccade. And how would that possibly be efficient? How that sure. if, 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 it's, if it involves learning, of course, but the it other, involves just activity of the. But the, the other part of this, would, which requires, it really sort of requires a thousand brains theory, right? It, it, it basically says, you know, if there's one thing to say, I have a, you know, I have a representation of all these locations, how can they all be updated? But if you've got thousands of this, the same module all keeping track of one. Uh, location, then uh, it seems more plausible. So it would also, to, so maybe getting to your point, uh, Jeremy, about the computational efficiency, it reminded me that this is only possible because we have thousands of columns that are all doing this independently in some sense. Um, and so it's not like you have to sort of go through them surreally or think about it in a massive scale, how we update all these things at once. Uh, I imagine back in these days, all the research, all the work, the reading I did in these in this field of neural network back then was um, there was no concept of anything like that. It was always a you know, mono, uh, monolithic neural network that did stuff. Uh, I don't know if you talked about that here at all. Or if he's just doing purely sort of conceptual ideas. He, does he try to relate this to neural networks? Or uh, to which the neural networks as in like the no, that's real, how would you implement this stuff in a real neural network? I mean, getting to Jeremy's point about computational efficiency, right. that comes into play. Is it, what what is your physical manifestation of this that you're imagining? Mm -hmm. Um, did he even think about that here at the moment, or was this purely abstract? No, he was. He would talk about units and, and networks and what works in practice uh, mm -hmm. a little bit. But, um, so, and and my reason of show, me showing this in red isn't marking it as wrong. It's marking it as different from what I was thinking. Uh, so it also it's it's useful to think like what what is his view of. Uh, what is Jeff Hinton's view of scenes and such? That what does he think hap happens? Um, and it, it is it's interesting to consider the idea that like as you walk around the world, you're always choosing a a a, um, a, ref a frame of reference for the scene. And like if you you see a stop sign over there, you you put that somewhere in your current scene, uh, and then and then it stays still as you move and you're walking around, and then you periodically change scenes. You periodically choose a new frame of reference. Uh, but he's talking about here the re location relative to the retinal position, right? Yeah, I didn't so, scroll. I haven't really scrolled around to show you other parts of that. Okay, so when I think about that, I mean, uh, I was writing about this in the book, you know, it's like when you, when you move through the world, there's these two ideas. One is that the items in the world are static relative to each other, but then your perception of where they are relative to you is everything's changing constantly. You know, I'm riding my bike to work, every little piece out there has a position and it's flowing past me, different, you know, constantly. And it, I'm aware of all that, yeah. so that that just tells you that the brain is doing this. Mm -hmm. The fact that I see those things at different positions and the distances tells me that, and they're everyone is changing. Um, tells me that this is actually occurring. Mm -hmm. um, that has to be occurring. All right, I'll see if I have anything else. I think it's totally thing. unfair to us to be critical of him at all. This is amazing. He did yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm not being critical. Yeah, I, 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 I don't want to come across. I don't. Want, I mean, this is absolutely amazing. He did all yeah. this stuff back then. Was the perception through the, the straw inspired by the understanding of like uh, the small uh, accurate detection of phobia? Like, was that something that he was aware of at that point? That I, I, I would say he was probably aware of it. Um, is that what he's referencing, or why is he doing this thought experiment? I don't think that's well. I don't know what he's doing here, but I, that's not how we thought about it. And I don't. So I'm assuming he's thinking about the same way we think about it, but maybe not. Um, yeah, I don't know the original motivation. Uh, he. He specifically wanted the system to be able to handle this case. 
And so he said, because the system can handle this case. And oh, because there are actually experiments where people, um, where people <laughs> move around, or, or where people are only shown like little bits, and they're, they're, uh, they gauge how well they can perceive stuff. So he's also trying to replicate actual results, or match the actual results. Uh, in this paper, I think that there's one other thing I highlighted. Um, okay, so it, you've heard me talk on both sides. Sometimes I've talked in support of an idea. Recently, I've been talking against it. The idea that um, that our brain learns a set of primitive features really well and then builds things out of them, uh, and such that once you once it's learned every once it's learned how to uh, what something looks like from all different viewing angles, um, it can then it can then recognize objects composed of those from multiple viewing angles. Um, and, he, and, and I specifically used the word primitive features when I was talking about this. Uh, so he said this kind of recursive definition of a shape in terms of shapes of, of its parts leads to a re regress that only terminates at hypothetical primitive features. Uh, and it, the fruit face fi figure is important because it suggests an alternate way out of the regress. Uh, what was the alternate way? Uh, I think it's more attention-based, attending to the whole attack. The composition of objects, not the, the, the idea that um, the idea that parts are represented differently than wholes. Well, that the the arrangement of subparts is part of the definition of the object, and not <coughs> the actual subparts and what they are constructed of uh, is the detail of the subparts, not the sure, part. sure, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. So like you can have a face without it, uh, without you can maybe specify a face without specifying what the subparts are. I, the key point here is he also uh, had bad things to say about this idea of everything bottoming out the set of primitives. He says there must be something else going on. Uh, there must be something. It's kind of attention based, of attending the holes, attending the parts. And when you attend to the well, he's saying whole, he's saying he's arguing against the idea that there's primitives. Yeah, that everything kind of bottoms out. Uh, it, but does it, I, I didn't read that. Much. Oh, the, uh, yeah, in the, context. It, 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 because it suggests, oh, 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 I see. He said there's an alternate way out yeah. other than the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, now I, I'll go on and show, okay, the next paper I'm not going to say that much. Uh, so it, it's funny, it seems it seems like exactly what we were on a study. Um, it's a good paper, a parallel computation that assigns canonical object-based frames of reference. Um, this paper. Can I ask you what's the term parallel referred to in this case? Is it just uh, neural networks? Is yeah, neural networks. networks. It, it, it's neural networks. Okay, so neural network science can have object based frames of reference. Um, uh, okay. And basically, he uses a union's narrowing approach to inferring the orientation of an object. You so say it means sort of like the, the same thing we do with four and six eight kind of thing? Uh, yeah, without movement. Um, he, he here's the general idea. Um, you connect. You have a set of. Um, okay. First of all, imagine the flux capacitor. Uh, now I have converted the. Now, now this is the flux capacitor just converted into like retina based units and uh -huh. object based units. Um, if you see a set of um, if you see an image, and and here's here's where he uses a little bit of magic. Um, if you have some way of initially guessing at a few possible orientations or a few possible uh, a few possible transforms, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so so you so you know one input of the flux capacitor. You have essentially a union of another part of it. Um, then you can use. That union being the possible transform. Yeah, and it might be big, but it's not everything. It, that's the important part. Uh, and um, now, combining that with a system that has learned objects, um, you what you basically have done is you've created this recurrent network that will settle on. Uh, if, if one of these is right, it's going to cause one of these objects to be recognized, which is going to cause uh, everything to settle down into basically it's a union's narrowing approach of whichever one of these transforms leads to a successfully recognized object is going to win out in this competitive uh, battle. 
I don't know if I'm being very clear. I was trying to be quick with this because it really is is, is an idea of. I think it's a it's a circuit version of the half half transformer voting idea that the other stuff with yeah. the the poses and orientation which have the most votes are going to win out, and the objects which are most consistent with a set of features at specific orientations those are the ones that are going to win out. It's not going to be a perfect. It's not going to be perfect though because like it's not voting on objects at orientations. It's voting on objects. Uh, and or, right orientations or, of the subparts. Uh, right, yeah. Like the H needs two things that are at relative vertical orientation and something at a mm -hmm. horizontal orientation. And by the way, there there is something in this paper I'm going to get to. I just wanted okay. to go by this part quickly. Because um, I feel bad that we didn't reference him in in our framework paper. Seems like maybe we should have. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it has resemblance to the hub transform, but I think the hub transform is even more powerful, basically, than this. This is like a, um, a weaker version of it. Because if because it's voting on this and this separately rather than at the same time. Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, this wasn't the main point of this. The main point of this is going to be uh, when he talks about um, what he calls the n squared problem. Um, when he talks about the idea that these transformations, these displacements, whatever we want to call them, um, they they require kind of this everything to everything mapping. Uh, you, you need to be able to map any any one um, in his language, any one retina based feature to any one object based feature yeah. in our language, any location, any location. Um, he brought up something that was kind of thought-provoking for me. I don't know if this is going to work, but it, it might be a really good idea. Uh, so first, um, I'm now reading. First, n itself, n being like the number of, OK, the n squared problem, how do you reduce n? Uh, first, n itself can be dramatically reduced before the mapping by distributed encoding of the individual features and mappings as patterns of activity in many different hardware units. Um, so now I'm going to bring back the spatial cooler thing. Uh, and now I'm going to switch to pointing to the whiteboard. Uh, wait, wait, wait. wait. What, just say, what's n again? Is this the amount of features in a, in a, in a space? Uh, in a yeah, f features at. Uh, so when he talks about. Here, yeah, I'll answer that right now. It would be like okay. the number of random based features and the number of object based yeah. features. Yeah, so yeah. the math between those n squared. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, I'll, I'll talk about idea one afterwards since we're already on this. Um, so, and once again, I don't know if this, I, I don't have an end to end working version of this in my head, but the fact that Hinton felt like writing about it uh, and said it worked, uh, and I think it sounds, it, it's, it's, it's intriguing, so I'm talking about it now, but it might not end up working. Uh, so, yeah, I do too. Transforming between spatial cooler style representations. Uh, so, to talk about what Henson said in that first paper when I brought up the spatial cooler, um, I've drawn like a, a square that is not actually 2D. It's like a high dimensional space of features at locations and orientations. Uh, and, and, they, and for now, think of this as retina based. So like there's an edge and it's over there and it's a certain, uh, um, a certain orientation or you can split that however you want. Uh, the idea that you have this set of units, these are sort of like the mini columns in the spatial cooler, uh, where one of them is essentially active when it, uh, in the area in the space around a point, another one's active in the area around another point, uh, and such that you can kind of cover this whole space by making the radiuses of these large enough. Uh, I, I'm just laying out the initial thing that this is like a, kind of like the spatial cooler. Um, now, what, what he said that. Um, I don't know if we've said something like this before, before, but it was not fresh in my mind if we have. Uh, imagine you have the same type of encoding of the um, object-based features, where they also are similar to like a spatial cooling, but not in a retina frame. Mm -hmm. and they're in an object frame. Um, it just changes the distributed. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Uh, the the thought-provoking thing here is now he points out that if you have it distributed this way, you could perform these translations, rotations, scales, transforms, whatever, um, on more of a unit by unit basis rather than a feature to feature basis. Uh, oh. So the, the spatial pooler, like it can encode an immense number of features because it kind of course codes them. So it can it can it can take a novel feature and transform it into sorry, wow, I'm jumping. Um, it can take a novel feature and represent it somehow. Um, and the thought-provoking idea here is, what if you could use a similar type of idea to transform those to a not to a to a different spatial pool, to a different. But on a on a feature by feature basis. Yeah, or like a segmented feature. Mini 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 Talking about that. Idea. No, I, I, I just didn't want to. Uh, so, so the, the first thing, it, the first thing I jumped at, oh, what a great idea! And the thing, the thing I found really attractive about it, which I think is not wrong, but uh, I was thinking like, oh, maybe this whole transformation could be done in a mini comp. That would be like, you know, wouldn't that be cool? But then, but it seems to me like you're just drawing it right here. You know, mini comp, the mini comp translation means I, I. You're showing them shunting over some other direction. You know, like well, this being column that gets the map, that being column, this being column gets the map. So, like this idea of compartmentalizing the computation to a single mini column is really right. It would be it, it's sort of like saying, yeah, I can I can remap feature one to the upper one there, but it, it could go to any one of those mini columns, and, and so I, I can't really isolate it to a single mini column. But but the same, it's still a powerful concept. Uh, my first reaction to it was too simplistic, I guess. Um, um, but I don't think we've ever talked about this idea, uh, which is a very interesting idea. So it um, it bears some resemblance to what we like about um, about modules, uh, the, the idea that you can form a finite number of connections, or a, a early in development you can form a, a set of connections that are module to module, uh, and then the multi-module code can now do novel things. They can now handle new things. Yeah. Um, that Did same he show this working? Uh, no. It, he t he said that. This was it like this would work, or did he say, "Here's an idea. <laughs> would maybe this will work." He said that the m squared problem can be improved okay. by sorry, using this idea, uh, okay. and, and that's that's where he left it. Uh, okay. and you get the sense from it that he's convinced it will work. Uh, he's probably worked it out in his head. Maybe so like he's simulated. He, he says here, there's not space here to include a yeah. more treatment <laughs> of the efficiency <laughs> and limitations. <laughs> you're joking. It's like right. you're, you're joking. That's what no, that's the, what the, bottom, the bottom of the... Oh, I, just, there's not space I, was, I was just making a joke about like, from last theorem. From last theorem. Yeah, I, before, I didn't even read that. I mean, this is just like that. You know, yeah. I saw the thing. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jeff, yeah, please tell us. <laughs> uh, not, he's not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you're listening, we have to Right up. Uh, readings like this looks a lot like the basic of convolution. Right? And uh, his idea of convolution came from this, from his uh, thinking of this. Because in convolution, you have just a local connection, right? You have you don't connect like, all inputs to uh, all uh, all neurons in the first layer from all neurons in the second layer. Mm -hmm. You only connect to a few of them. So you have, a, let's say, a, each feature map is to a small part of the input space. So convolutions kind of draw on that idea of uh, like not end-to-end -end representation, but end to like a smaller space. Okay. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but this reading like this. Is kind okay. Of I've always seen a similarity between convolutions and many column receptive fields. Right? And that, that's the connection you're making. Yeah, I think I, I don't know a lot about when you call demonstration for it. Just like reading like this looks a lot like he's talking about convolutions. But okay. it is. Yeah, I, I can talk to you a little after that because part of what you said reminds me. Late in the next paragraph, he talks about doing a multi layer uh, transform uh, and that you can. This is 1981. Yeah. When did he come up with the idea of convolution? Well, he didn't. Yeah. Um, Fukushima originally did with the Neocognitron, they had something similar, and then Yamlukun did the deep learning version. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Uh, 
but um, I think the, the capsules are kind of the latest instantiation of this yeah because it explicitly learns these transforms in these local uh, limited connectivity way yeah and um, well this these papers if you go to if you go and start reading about uh, I, I noticed that when I went and started reading some capsule um, stuff they linked to this, a set of papers and one of them was the one yeah, it's like about. he's been thinking about this for a long yeah. time it's just an evolution well I mean the, the, as you hinted a moment ago I think that if this could be treated this way that mm -hmm. in some sense like the individual columns can compute their own transform um, then that's this very very powerful generalization yeah. tool right which we don't really have at this point in our logic mm -hmm. in, in this part of the, the thinking of our thinking um, he says something, can I ask you, if you if he says here, uh, specific features, uh, below, just below the blue line, are specific features coded by activity in all the units whose regions contain. So I assume he's saying, okay, all those, as I said, those are like the green circles in it, right? Yeah, the um, regions, yeah. The number of effectively different features, which is a, sub, which is a set of these units, uh, can they greatly exceed the number of units? So yeah, so I could have like a 10 mini, 100 mini columns, but I can encode billions of features yeah. uh, in them. Um, this type of encoding is especially effective when, this is the sentence that tripped me up, especially effective when the number of features present at any one time, well, how do you have a number of features? I thought the whole idea is you can have one feature present at any one time, is much smaller than the number of possible discriminable. Mm. Uh, don't you just have one feature present at any time? Uh, in his case, he's, he's, when we think about a spatial puller, we usually don't have unions. He kind of does have unions. When you look at in his in his mental model, when you look at an image, you activate what you could call a union of retina-based features. Okay, so that's unlike the spatial puller. Right, that's the difference. Yeah. So all the answer, the number of effectively different features that can be. Or is he, he 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 may be talking about a number of features not in the same physical location, but. If you think about the H again, it's got three features, two vertical lines and one horizontal line. They're not all spatially on top of one another, they're separated. Well, but he's still using the word feature here as the ensemble activity of the units. I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I tuned out what you said there, so maybe you could say it again. Uh, if you go back up to like the H, I don't know if it was in this paper, right. but um, the H has three features yeah. present simultaneously. Yeah, yeah I got it. You know, uh, I want to keep that. So that, that's sure. all. Yeah. 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 They don't have to be all but, physical. But I thought positive. he was referring to that as a unit. Uh, each of those, he says, a feature is encoded by the activity of all the mm -hmm. units. So I would, have, I thought he was saying that the feature is the H and the units are the individual lines. And you're saying the units are the individual lines. Mm -hmm. Are you saying the features? Are the, I'm, I'm does the diagram, does the capital diagram not show what the units are? I think there's reference to the units at the bottom, isn't it? Uh, uh, well, the thing is with this diagram, he's showing the simplistic, but he's showing the simplistic version here that's not the population coded yet, yeah. uh, and then he brings in the population. Yeah, okay, so the units, units are just neurons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. these are the retina based units, so I, I guess I guess I still understand this, maybe you do and I understand it. So he's saying the individual units are like individual mini right, so in some sense like that. Oh, no. Um, the individual but, units are, um, th these end up being, I know they're neurons. this will be coded by a population. They're hierarchical oh. vectors, right? That's encoded by a population so, too? Uh, so a unit is a population? Yeah. A unit is receiving input from a population just like a standard hierarchy, right? Th this so, is the part of the paper where he's first doing the naive version where everything's represented by units. Uh, okay. And then later, then later he jumps into this idea, but it's not going to be represented by units. Everything's going to be a population code. Uh, and so, can we go down to the, yeah? Okay. So, I, I think this I think this is consistent with that. He says the specific features coded by activity in all the units which we contain. So that's a population code. A feature is a population code. Yeah. Units. So that's consistent. Um, the number of effectively different features that can be great can greatly exceed the number of units. That's just like us too, right? Yeah. And um, so that's. Um, this type of encoding is especially effective on the number of features present. Okay, so that's where you're saying he's assuming there's a union of these features. Yeah, basically, 
like he would call. Um, so can I interpret that saying unions are really useful as long as you don't have too many of them? Yes, that's what he's saying. Yeah, because that's our belief too, right? Unions only work up to a certain number of, you know, for a union so many things, and then yeah. they then they stop working. Yeah. So he would say here there are two features. Like the population code here is. He, would, he doesn't use the word union, of course, but he's, he would say there are two features here. There's not just yes, one yeah. feature here. So let me keep going on. It's kind of especially effective on the number of features because any one time, so it's small number of pockets. Yes, we would agree. That means unions can't be too big. Um, so that all of that, I think we understand in our own language. And so he's saying, I don't have a space here. You know, we could we could say we could say, oh, point to our our, our you know sparsity paper and our unions and things like that. But that's that's not talking about this particular transform I did here, right? That paragraph. Uh, Initially it was, but then he this was in this paper he hadn't yet addressed population codes, so he had to say. Yeah, so can I just can, can I read this again? Just make sense. He says yes. here uh, first. He talks about distributed clothing. First, and itself can be dramatically reduced. Meaning, to my mind, I would say, oh, we get lots of fewer mini columns. Uh, before the mapping by distributed encoding, yeah, of the individual features and mappings as patterns of activity and many different hard units. Okay, so that's all consistent with our work so far. Um, but that's not getting to this channel idea. So the channels are referring to the flux capacitors as this channel. Mm -hmm. Right above that it goes, if there are n retina units, each of which activate n object-based units, n squared channels are required. Um, are those channels like the lines between oh. a, a unit and a unit? Yeah. Why does, why does he say that this is any indiscriminate mapping can occur? Uh, I mean, at, in the real world, that doesn't happen, right? I mean, in the real world, only some of these mappings occur. Am I wrong about that? I'm a little lost. Uh, what's the, what, did mean, he say indiscriminate mappings, or was that your words? I, I thought you said that. The same report well, the, the n-squared channels are required. The n-squared channels say that I can do oh, any mapping. Okay. Every feature needs to connect to every object. Yeah. No, you're right. It, uh, depending on how you set this up, maybe cert I mean, you'll never have like um, a corner mapping to a circle. Or yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So I mean, he's saying if I have to do it, any 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 time of a mapping between this code and that code, I can use it using fewer. And I, it requires every unit here to connect every unit there. I can use fewer units because I'm using sparse distributed representations. Uh, so I get my capacity by having an SDR as opposed to dedicated grandmother cells, and uh, uh, and then but that paragraph doesn't doesn't point out the, the key item you were just making that, that you can do this on a unit by unit basis. Um, I don't think it says that in the paragraph. Well, kind of the part I highlight is the closest. Uh, so uh, the for the mapping. But n itself can be doing. He's just saying I don't have to have a lot of mini comms in our language. You can get you can get a lot of it can be dramatically reduced number of comms before the mapping by distributing yeah. coding. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm sorry. It, um, it, and, but the implication here that you can reduce n and then somehow do this mapping. It's, it's that's what this paragraph's implying. I'm sorry that I can't pick up the exact. Well, the question here is, do I have to map from a population code to a population code? Is that my mapping? Or is it a unit to a unit? Um, and uh, my assumption has always been it's a population code to a population code. Um, and so the individual units are meaningless at this point. Um, um, but I'd say if there's a big idea here, it's that you can, that you can do unit to unit. OK. Uh, and but I'm not sure I agree with you that I can read that out of that that sentence. Um, he's he's just saying that the if there was a unit to unit mapping, it would be a lot less uh, because it's n squared. So if he is saying here that the n squared problem is being reduced by this, you wouldn't say that if. Um, so I think he's saying you can just get many fewer n. N can be reduced dramatically by using sparse coding. If it was population code to population code, this wouldn't help. Uh, the, the, the n squared problem wouldn't be helped at all. Yeah. Well, it, it would in the sense that the n would be a lot smaller. But the n squared wouldn't be. 
Yeah. Okay, yeah. It, 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 it's implied, not stated explicitly. He, he sort of goes from the fact, well, I could, one, one critical interpretation he could say, like, well, if I, if I want to do a mapping, regardless, I don't even know what the mapping function is, to, to some magic mapping function. Um, uh, it could require, in its extreme limit, uh, it could require n squared mappings between every individual unit to every individual unit. And by, by reducing n, then that, in that limit, then um, those mappings are reduced. Uh, but, uh, but I'm not sure I would go to the next stage and saying, well, in, in actuality, we're mapping population code about, you know, that I, I, I'm not sure I would jump to the conclusion you jumped to. Um, I think I'm jumping. I think I'm correctly showing what he's saying, but he, um, I don't, I'm not confident well, whether it will work. He doesn't make it obvious that it will work. But, uh, but it might. It, it seems plausible to me that, um, OK, like, suppose the object-based features and retina-based features. This is just kind of a proof of concept. Um, suppose that they are you know, exactly the same, where um, just they're essentially the same thing, just viewed from a different reference frame. Uh, so there, if there is a if there is a cell or a mini column that corresponds to a circle here, there's a, there is a, a, an equivalent one over here, and you're always going to be able to. I don't know the right way to draw this yet. Uh, you, you're always the point is though. Imagine just as the proof of concept, these are the exact same code, uh, just from different yeah, reference frames. Right. Yeah. Um, then it's not hard to believe that some mapping will exist. Uh, from from unit to unit. Uh, yeah. I thought the object-based features were compositions of random-based features. Is that not the way I think that's? Uh, they're not. Um, so uh, here, I'll show you the picture. No, you're you're right. You're right and wrong. Uh, it's because these top these top ones are compositions, but the way he thinks of it is. The initial ones aren't compositions; they're just transformations of the retina features. Are there features. three layers of some sort of hierarchy here? Uh, I would say that the actual hierarchy he has one one additional level of hierarchy here. Okay. So there's uh, a transformation and a hierarchy. Uh, hierarchy. The transformation is from the retina to the first level. Of the yeah. Hierarchy. So this is a transformation, and then it's recognizing objects using those. So it's hierarchy in as much as our columns favor is hierarchy. The, the idea, which well, this is exactly the capsule's idea, almost identical. Yeah. Um, is it, I thought I thought you said the capsule idea sort of lacked any concept of reference frames. Or, uh, no, I didn't say that. Uh, no. What, there was a, there was, you had a, there was some major issue about them that the, that they weren't equivalent to what we were proposing. Well, there's no movement in it. Oh, there's no movement. There's no concept of. Uh, but it is encoding. The objects are in a more invariant re reference frame than the, the component features. Exactly like this. Like, uh, you know, if you take a diagonal line and you rotate it by that orientation, it becomes a horizontal line. Or if you take a horizontal line and you tilt it this way, then it becomes a vertical line. Those are the pairs of you know, feature plus orientation gives you this kind of allocentric representation of the feature. And then if all three of them are there, then you get an H. Then you get the most votes for H. So I mean, if you go through the things, it's exactly no. Maxwell's idea. Uh, and it's, I think it's the voting scheme. So we, uh, is it worth us studying the capsule idea for a little bit more insight? It, it might be. Um, I think his talk is a little bit clearer than the capsule paper. We can go through the capsule's paper. No. But of course, now it's all couched in this optimization, you know, neural network framework, but we can, we can go through it. Maybe it was a capsule network research update paper from last year. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, there's two of them, okay. uh, last couple of years, but then he had a, has a talk from several years ago where he talks about it, and I found the concepts clear in that talk. In the paper, it, it gets a little experience, uh, uh, you know, c confused with the specific experiments and the specific optimization part of it. The talk is older than the paper. Talk is much older. Like the yeah, talk is much older. It's like five years old. Marcus, is this idea here similar to the displacement idea in the sense that displacement works on a module by module basis? 
I would say that that's the um, that that is the, the, so the principle that unites these is that by splitting this into like a computing. If I, if I if I thought of those triangles as opposed to mean columns, if I thought of them in terms of modules, like um, a grid cell module, mm -hmm. and to a grid cell module, then that is what we've said. Right? That is your, the displacement idea that a module. Well, it's kind of this uh, module to module. But it, then, then these are no longer just units. This would be a, a module, a grid cell module. This is the grid cell module, mm -hmm. and and then and then in that case, these connections really are just like that. They don't go across like this, right? Because there's, a, there's an encoding in one module, and encoding in another module, and, and I do this encoding, I do this transformation, I do this transformation, I do this transformation, and then the whole thing works. Um, so that idea of a one to one was definitely in the displacement cell idea. But it's not anywhere in our um, in our mini column idea. Um, so if you said, "Oh yeah, this is the, this is the displacement module idea," I would say, "Oh yeah, you're right. That's that's what it is." And did you think about that? Did you yeah, and I would. Yeah, I mean, you didn't I would bring say it up because we were talking about it as a mini column idea, but it's really more like a displacement. Well, I, I guess what I brought up was that um, that. What we liked about the multi-module idea is that it allows you to do some set of learning early on and then reuse yeah. that for novelty. Yeah. And this and this has that same property. Yeah, I agree. So, but I've never been able to unite that with mini comms. That's why I'm always struggling to figure out what the role of mini comms is in the whole cortical column, right? Um, so at first, it's, oh, maybe this is a clue to that. But this is really pretty much describing uh, what you done with displacement modules. It's 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 this basic idea of the module. You know, the grid cell modules, displacement modules, and, um, you can operate them on them independently and together they mean something. The question is, is could that principle apply someplace else too? Mm -hmm. um, I guess, yeah, for me the the thought provoking thing is first of all, there's this weird idea of what if you could spatial pool and the objects reference, right? Uh, or if you, Spatial, if, if you train a spatial pooler or something similar um, on your retinas reference frame, and you train a, a different one on uh, some object-based reference frame, of otherwise the same, the same input. I don't know the exact way to say this, but if you train two different spatial poolers, um, could you have them learn in such a way that you can now do transforms between them? Mm -hmm. So such that the many column and the one, uh, there are these mappings that exist from from one to the other given given the flux capacitor. Yeah. Okay. It's the beginning of an idea. It, yeah, like, it, yeah. it was it was the biggest new thing that popped well, there's out. There's a lot of thought working things in this. Yeah. I agree. I mean, we can try to go through the capsule stuff again because there it's basically his new way of doing exactly so that. So that that's what. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, it's going through this this. Three-way uh, okay. settling process. The, the settling is like um, that, that's not what the, the settling is. One thing like this inference, this Huff transform, this idea of voting on like, what, hey, there's a face. This I votes on the fact that there's a face here or in mm -hmm. a certain way. Yeah, I, like that. But the representations are learned okay. in addition to the settling process. It's not just the settling process. Sure. Okay. So in that sense, you know, if you're doing a spatial pooler, yeah. something you're learning a representation of an object. You know, the whole, this, I mean, you mentioned that the capsule idea has no movement in it. Um, if you weren't considering movement, then you might have to force yourself to thinking about a spatial pull for the object reference frame. Because that's all you've got to work with. But the beauty of grid cells and movement is you have, a, you have something which, um, I don't know, it, when you add that, it gives you this huge, bigger palette to work with. <laughs> So I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if we study capsules without movement ideas, I wonder, I wonder how useful it will be. Um, I think the movements add a lot of power. Oh, wow, yeah. clearly. I mean, the whole system is built around the whole idea, and, and our winnowing down process is built on that idea, too, right? That you move to winnow down your, your answers. And well, we have two. We have the voting between columns, and then we have the, the movement idea. Um, hmm. Let's see, the time it is.
should I, should I go ahead and say, this one's quicker, the, yeah. the, the, other, the other idea. So this is going all the way back to the first paper, the one that Hinton sent you. Um, so you may have read this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, put an extra interpretation on top of it. Uh, so um, first of all, I've drawn a letter here uh, that has been rotated. Um, and what has been observed experimentally is that if people are instructed to um, to look at a letter that uh, and look at a letter like this that has been rotated and answer quickly whether it's backwards or not, or whether it, like it, uh, if this were upright, would it be forwards or backwards? Um, people aren't able to do that immediately. Uh, they they yeah, have to mentally yeah, they yeah. have to mentally rotate it um, and. Early on, this was used as a case against um, the idea that our brain represents objects in a, in a viewer invariant way. Uh, because if you have, if you represented objects in, in a viewer invariant way, if you had some way like, hey, yeah, that's an R, uh, then you would immediately know. But no, that's not, that's not an R. That's a that's a funky R. It's backwards. Uh, the in the paper, in that first one about reference frames, they actually did some experiments um, where they actually came to the conclusion that um, people probably do have these viewer invariant models of objects. Um, however, uh, I'll put it first in their terminology. However, those models don't prescribe a handedness, which is to say the axes of this reference frame might be right-handed or it might be left-handed. Uh, so, which is to say, like, you would think that when you orient yourself, what you need to do is figure out, okay, which way is up and which way is north. And, and, and north is always in quotation marks here. It's not, it's not global north. Um, and once you know which way is up and which way is north, you know everything. You know orientation. Um, but under this view, this idea that, um, that uh, there's actually a little bit more flexibility there, you also need to figure out which way is left or which way, which, which way is west or whatever. Um, it, There's an alternate interpretation here? Yeah, an alternate interpretation, and they did some experiments to suggest that, to, to, to conclude that actually people can recognize letters immediately um, if you run the experiment correctly, uh, if you run the experiment in a, in a clever way. I could, I could talk about that more. But the idea is, the, the inference from their results is the idea that um, your, your mental models for objects um, this is how I would market it, rather than talk about it as a flaw. Uh, they're flexible to reflection. Uh, so the idea that when you see an object that is a mirror image of a, of a reverse of, of something you've seen before, um, you'll be able to recognize it, no problem. Uh, and you might not even be conscious of the fact that it's backwards. Or if you are, it's through some other mechanism. I have an alternate interpretation. Possible. Actually. I wonder what it'll be. I, 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 what is it? Then? Well, we draw this as if these are two D objects. Yeah. But what if everything you do in your life is three dimensional? Yeah, I wonder that. Is, I wonder. Right. Same. So I, I can recognize an R as it's rotating through the plane. Yeah. And so this is the same object. It's just I haven't specified you which just, direction. You, you walked around. Yeah, I walked around the back of the object. So. I don't have a rebuttal to that. <laughs> I, I wondered if that was. I, I, like the thing is, these papers are from 1981. I think there might be one. There, there are mental rotation papers now with 3D objects. I don't remember exactly. I mean, the normally, if I have a 3D object, I, that's what it means. If that if that was a 3D structure, I mean, yeah. then, then that is a correct recognition of that structure. You know, it flips and backs. It's not a yeah. backwards R. It's just an R from the back. <laughs> I don't have a good response to that. Right now, just giving a little bit of benefit of the doubt I bet they're right, but I don't have a good answer to that. Yeah. Uh, and so just these, this idea, though, that like now I'm thinking of orientation a little bit differently in that um, like I show a rat here surrounded by these few familiar landmarks, and it remembers, like, oh, I know this environment. Uh, but in fact, this environment that it remembers is kind of near image. Um, so this path integration system is going to have to be such that like it's going to be backwards. It's like turning turning clockwise it has to cause its head direction cells to turn counterclockwise. It's funny in this scenario here with the room, I'd say. Yeah. I think counter to what I said a moment ago, they are. I think I would recognize immediately those backwards. I would. I, I just, Fair. Yeah. 
I would say from any position in that room, I'd say this room is backwards. I'm never going to get. A, I'm never going to say, oh, I have to rotate it back to the original view I had. Yeah. Um, this makes me wonder at times. Or, uh, okay, this gets a the when the when the purpose of this is generalization, then this seems plausible. When the purpose is to truly recognize a familiar environment, like I know this specific room, then you're totally right. And I think those uh, might be two. Uh, I don't know. It just seems like I have trouble even generalizing a back room. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, I've always wondered, we talk about the parallels between uh, the hippocampal complex and the neocortex, but they're just parallels, they're not identical. And um, I've always wondered about the representation of space that in the entomonic cortex, it really could have started out primarily 2D and then they added 1D. We talked about the idea that there's a gravity vector, you know, cell, but that doesn't apply to the cortex. There's no gravity vectors from my hand and the object I'm holding in my hand. And so that, you know, maybe the cortex really is truly three-dimensional and uh, in a more in inherent way. And, and maybe the entomotic cortex is more inherently two-dimensional. And so I see that reflection problem in the room space, which is the entomotic cortex. I see that as, yeah, I can, this room backwards. I don't have to reorient the room to realize it's backwards. I think that's how it would be. Um, where on the R, I do have to think about it. I have to say, like, oh, well, this is the normal way I normally see it. You know? I'm just making some casual arguments one way or the other, that these may not be exactly equivalent problems um, based on what part of the brain they're in. So anyway, this part, I was summarizing what Hinton said and trying to extrapolate it a little bit. Yeah. It feels like so many of the things that were done early on in AI and early on in neural networks and even today is vision-based. And so, so much of that is based on two-dimensional images. Um, and you just have to be cautious of, you know, maybe that really impacts how they think about it. So this, the idea that this R is backwards is only, is only a concept for a two-dimensional projection of the letter R. Um, so this might not be backwards at all. It's just rotated and flipped around. <laughs> okay. Maybe if you look at some, there are probably some papers doing image recognition and grid image. There might be some insight in that. Like, how are they doing it? Is there some difference in the the way they are approaching the problem. What, in neural networks? Yeah, look, I don't, I don't know any papers, but I think there would be papers like doing image recognition of 3D images. That would be interesting if, they, if there was some true sort of, um, I don't know, yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if there's something we could learn from that. Yeah. I don't know what I would learn They might solve that problem in a completely different way. And, you know, just we're doing like depth inference from 2D images, right? That's kind of like projecting extrapolating a three-dimensional structure from 2D. Yeah, but it was not thinking about the extrapolating, I was thinking about um, doing straight recognition from the 3D model. From the 3D model. From the 3D model, yeah. I don't know. Like, most of that stuff is just like taking convolutional networks and feeding in the data. So, but uh, it, will yeah. it work out of the box, or do you have to do any tricks? So how do you approach that? That's what I'm saying. Might be someone solved this problem, there might be some things. It's funny, I just, just things to think about, like, I look at this and I can immediately read that word. <laughs> um, what does that tell me? I mean, I know it's backwards. I, I don't, I don't say to myself, oh, these letters are all backwards. It's, I'm not sure if it's saying anything different than this, than this or not. Um, um, it's like in this case, I have to say, oh, is this, is this, I say that's an R, and then I have to say, well, is it written forward or backwards? And to do that, I have to sort of rotate it in my head. So this, I, uh, that is way less symmetrical than the R. The R is a highly symmetrical letter, which is one of the difficulties. Why, why is the R more symmetrical than these guys? Because it's almost actually symmetrical through the vertical plane. If you, if you make it upright, Practically a symmetrical letter like an A. It's closer to A, right? In some ways. Is it more? Is it closer to A than like a K and or B? The entirety of back is far less symmetrical. I'm talking. The entire word is super asymmetrical. Oh, oh. So as soon as you proceed the B, you can start to make predictions of okay, I know which direction the B is pointing. It's very clear, and so I can make predictions of okay, if Sakab left is going to show me a C or something yeah. like that. Whereas the R, I think it requires this mental rotation because it's unclear what prediction you would make. You're looking at the head of the R, and say, yeah. okay, I know I can go down in the reference frame of the R, and I'm going to yeah. see some legs. But with the orientation of the legs, I don't remember exactly whether it's you know, straight versus angled on the left, or... Maybe the, maybe the equivalent here would be something more like, uh, um, 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 
Well, so what if we did the first letter experiment with a B? There's actually no way to write it wrong, is there? <laughs> yeah. right. this, 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 right. may not be, this may not be worth anything, so uh, I'm just, I'm just, these are just thought experiments. It, it's probably not, uh, um, there's, so there's no wrong B, is, is that, do we agree on that? Then you can just take a yeah, there's no wrong B. I, I, so. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just toying in my head, can I learn anything by thinking about other problems? I'm not making a point, I'm not making a position. I'm not making a point. I, I'm just playing with ex mental, mental experiments. I'm just wondering, can you learn more about the different versions of this problem? So I think it, so to me it comes down to the ability to make predictions that are oriented and then validate those predictions with you know, attention or anything else. And with the backward that you showed, I think the predictions are very easy to generate because of the clear perceptible orientation of the B. You know that the B is pointing in the direction of the rest of this word that you've seen before, and so you can make a very approximate prediction of what yeah. letters you're going to see next. Yeah. yeah. And, and so when you, the, the one that you run on the right uh, invalidates that prediction right away because you're predicting some sort of C that's consistent with the direction of the B and you don't see it. Uh, to me, that, that jumps out. Does that jump out to other people? The right word? Um, maybe a problem there. Yeah. I guess that's wrong for multiple reasons. <laughs> it's, it's especially. Um. <laughs> So it's harder to read. Yeah, it's interesting to see sentences that are written out as if we're rotated around it, whereas mirror flip stuff is very hard to read. Uh, and people sometimes use that as a code, uh, uh, which is a, which is a something you would not would so not what, happen in the real world. Which, which is hard yeah. to read? The mirror. A mirror or the whole sentence. I think we're used to reading things in other orientations. So like you yeah. can read a paper that's upside down. If someone else is looking at it, you yeah. can sort of read it too. So, yeah, if something is consistent with 3D rotations. Okay. Can I tell you yeah. something funny? I have a, a niece, she's four years old. She just turned five. And she started writing, but she writes backwards. <laughs> that's her way of writing. And my sister were very worried, like, why is she writing backwards? <laughs> she the doctor. The doctor said, it's common. At this age, like there are a lot of kids who learn how to write backwards. That's backwards just backwards. backwards. When you say backwards, like, what do you mean like by backwards? Like in a mirror way, like just you wrote backwards. So, so it's not like she's writing the, the sentence from left to right. She's she's writing the letter backwards. Yeah. No, no, she's writing left to right, like like you wrote it backwards. Like it's in a mirror. You have to read it in a mirror. Yeah, you have no, to no, mirror wouldn't do that. Mirror uh, keeps the order, but just flips each one. Depends on what kind yeah. of backwards you mean. When you when she writes it down, I yeah, she, she writes in a mirror way. So each word, the whole sentence. Yeah. Or? <laughs> Well, it could be, it's different to say each word versus each sentence, the whole sentence. I mean, well, I, mean, I could. She just writes words. I mean, somebody would like her <laughs> name and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but the doctor said it's common. And then at some age, it just flips. Then oh. the, the kid starts to wow. write like we do. So, mm. okay. and now, it's like a condition or something. And it's temporary. So, I don't know if it's that speaks in the brain or maybe it's just like a, um, I don't know. A, when I was a kid, I wrote my J's backwards for the first couple of years. I just could not get the, of my own name, I was trying to write it. The J yeah. went in the opposite direction. Is that I think right? it, it, it might be something cuter, you know, like you write like this, you write right now to the back. Like what? In Arabic language, you write from the beginning to the, from the end to the beginning, right? So. I think the significance of orientation comes later than the significance of specific features. When I was writing that J, I, was I knew that there was a curve in it, I knew there was a line in it. But exactly how they're oriented to each other, that felt like it required more. Effort. I'm hmm. Are we almost done here, I think? We are. <laughs> One little trick I can pass along is if, if you try to say, like, can you sign your name backwards? It's really hard. But there's a trick to doing it. Mm. The trick to doing it is you sign mm. your name with both your left and your right hand at the same time mm. with two pens. And then you do them in parallel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it though. You yeah. just just you sign your name and just mirror the motion in your left hand. Yeah, because then you can transfer your knowledge from the. You just you're just basically you're just there is an ability to make your left and right hand move in op, move in opposite directions in all uh, cases. Yeah. So if you just can you sign backwards with your foot? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it doesn't work very well, but it's much better than if you just try to think of how to sign. Yeah. Um, 
I suppose in practice you could be mentally doing it with your right hand and just writing with your left hand. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's, that's really interesting yeah. papers. Uh, I'm still I'm still piecing it together in my mind. That was yeah. just things that stood out to me as interesting or so, worth yeah. saying. So what I wonder is, so this is all 1981, yeah. and then a few years ago he has capsules. And I know there's this whole deep learning thing that happened in the <laughs> middle, but did he write about this stuff in between at all? Uh, I, I know it maybe got sidetracked into doing back propagation and, that, and right. that works, but <laughs> did he, do you know if he did anything? I've, I've seen it, but I, I don't have a good you sense for it. You know, it's interesting, because I wrote to him and talked about his capsules work, and I said yeah. how prep and he didn't, he didn't just point out back to the 81 paper. He didn't but this is basically capsules. Well, I'm just saying he didn't give me anything in between. He right. didn't say, oh, I have a whole series of like, yeah, maybe yeah. there's stuff in between. But he just like, here's, here's a paper. No, this is exactly <laughs> capsules and even the back and forth, uh, the fact that you have to estimate the, the, the transform and estimate the object simultaneously, huh. that's in capsules. And he uh, cited the Huff transform paper in, in this paper. It's exactly the same thing. I don't know Huff transforms. Should I have, learn Huff transforms? It's voting in a oh. public space. Um, voting I could, I, in public space? I could describe it if you want. I, like especially, I would say, um, what I often call the classroom idea is the Huff transform. It, oh. it, it, it is complete, like it is it is completely voting on an object at a certain location and orientation, which we, we haven't integrated. That's what Huff, uh, the Huff transform is specific to that problem? No, no, it's a generic thing where you have a parameter space yeah. that describes variations of an object, yeah. but you don't know what that is. And each component votes for where it might be in the parameter space, and then you look to see which has the most votes. Um, so it is object focused. It's not. It's not object. I mean, the way I described it could be applied to audio. It could be applied to anything. Anything which has transformation parameters and features. I mean, I'm um, just, I guess I'm saying it's not like a, a purely mathematic, purely mathematical thing, like you know, a Fourier transform or something like that. No, it, it's a voting process. It's a voting process. Be, Related to some sort of structure or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's iterative. Um, no, 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 just once. One one shot. Usually one shot. Right. Yeah. Like you see an eye, and that that causes that the eye kind of votes that uh, that there's a face below it or the face center. What would be the what would be the, the, the if I would look it up? What would be the how would I how would someone describe the transform? What is, what, what is the it's language? not uh, the name is very confusing. It's not a transform as such. It's just. You you have a space that you're voting in, and everything votes. In, uh, it's like like an eye would vote where it might be on a face, and a nose would vote where it might be in a face. H O U G. The future extraction of image analysis. Uh, it's, it's more than well. It depends on the features. Yeah, it depends on the features. Why is it used for? Um, it's used for a lot of stuff. Uh, if you find looking for if you have a bunch of random dots and you want to find a circle. Half transform is a really good way to do it. Um, the oh, best fit circle, for example. This says find the perfect instances of object within a certain yeah. class of shapes. Yeah. Okay. So you have to know the the. I, mean, I can I can describe it if you want. I don't know if we have time. I don't know. I'd be interested in hearing it. I don't know if we have time or not. But uh, well, here's a very simple example. I'll raise my stuff with me. I'm also like doing like a prototype fitting. Uh, so if you, suppose you're, you have an image, and you have a bunch of dotted lines, and you want to find the line that best goes through this. Uh -huh. Maybe line not the best example, because this could also be a regression. <laughs> 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 um, let me, let me, let me, let me you want to find that, is that a banana or an apple? Yeah, let's say you have kind of a circle. And you want to find the, and you have a lot of random stuff, and you want to find this, the center and diameter of the circle that best fits this, these points. Okay, like how would you do that? Sort of like, but I sort of know I have a circle, right? You have to know you have a circle. Yeah. Seems like a big inference with a single uh, two parameters, like um, a radius or something. Yeah. So, so the half transform way is is Bayesian in some sense, but it, uh, you can there's a three D space. Um, X, Y, and R that will com that defines all possible circles in here, mm. right? And so you look at this dot here, and you put a uh, a vote for every 
x, y, r that's consistent with having a circle here, which is <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that a huge, huge number? Uh, it's it's not. It's I mean, not. It's it's smaller than all possible. It's smaller than all possible. Okay. Uh, so there'll be some whole bunch of points in. Uh, you'll add votes in a whole bunch of places here that correspond to this dot being in some circle. Uh -huh. Then you do that for every single dot, yeah. and the one there'll be one here that has more votes than anything else, and that's going to be the best. Okay. So circle. now, in, in so that's a Bayesian. It, it's, it's it's Bayesian, and you're accumulating evidence. There's no iterative thing in here. Terms of the, in terms of the colostrum idea, in that case, we have a bunch of units who don't know their location, right? And you said by unit, you mean here like some sensors, basically? Or uh, well, no, I uh, a mini column. Okay. I mean a column. Okay, okay columns. Okay. Right, right. Is it well? Yeah, a column. He's yeah, a column. That's, that's correct. Yeah. All right. Each column it has it has some location representation. It needs to know where its location is, but yeah. it doesn't. It has no way of knowing. Right. Um. So, uh, how would I do that in using this technique here? I mean, each column has. I guess you're saying based on its sensory input would limit its possibilities of where it might be in the world. I mean, how how would it, well, how do I limit it down at all? I mean, this system only works if there's a if all possible mappings are, there has to be some subset that's possible. You have to sample in order to do this at all, right? Because How would that work for the mini columns? I mean, for the columns. I got a, I got a bunch of columns. Each one has some unknown location, and you want to vote for the colostrum. Right. So they, they need to all vote in some common reference frame. They all need to vote. Uh, if uh, I mean, we're talking about uh, here. This is a hand. Like I said, the, the, like. Nice hand. Yeah, yeah. So the, <laughs> these fingers are all, all, all sensing things. Like yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, and these are all like you know sensing things. Like uh, I mean, this is like a sensor. This is a sensor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. Uh, each of these sensors has some um, has some displacement from the, some the body's common reference frame. We'll call it we'll just draw a circle. Oh, so you're not trying to find the location on the, on the object of sensing. You're trying to find the location relative to uh, the body or something like that. We're, we're really looking for uh, there's a there's a there's a object uh, and what you want to vote on is like Thought bubbles. Uh, this uh, this agent is voting on like here. This like smiley. Uh, it, it I thought is, I thought we were trying to figure out the location of each one of these guys uh, relative to the object's reference frame. I thought that's what we were trying to do. We are. Uh, and, the, and and each one on its own uh, to solve the grasp and understand the object thing. Yeah. If we didn't have, if all we had is a sensory input in this thing, then all we really can have is a, a bag of features. And that's not sufficient. Right. And so I thought you were saying is that, that these guys somehow vote together uh, independent of the body. I thought they were voting together based on their features. Um, and somehow the colossal was going to resolve what the possible different positions would be. Well, it would just be bag of features if that was all the information you had. You also need some displacement oh, between right, sensors right. and some common reference frame. Right? Um, well, uh, okay. Oh, I thought the common reference frame would be here because I could say something like, um, "Well, this feature, this feature, this feature, and those could appear in different places on here." Mm -hmm. But um, you know, I see your point. All right, all right. So keep going. Uh, so. I have to, I have to, I have to, you're saying I, I this only is, is bag of features no matter what I do. So I need to say, I need to have another reference that I know something about. Yeah. Um, uh, so if I'd taken time to plan this, I would have drawn a, a perfect object that illustrates this perfectly. But um, so like, let's go through this sensor by sensor. Uh, this sensor is going to essentially vote that um, you know, either there is a um, a coffee cup here, um, or there a is a coffee cup above the dot. 
Um, or, 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 else. or it could be something else yeah. completely. Like there could be a, like a marker here. Yeah. Just, uh, here marker. Uh, that's, that's a marker. Okay. Uh, and um, so, so like this column is essentially voting for both of these. At some position relative to me. Yeah. But I'm assuming I know my owl centric position there, or my my body centric position, my body ego centric position of that. Uh, yeah, you know the ego centric position of the center. Uh -huh. uh, so you can now imagine. I haven't drawn a perfect example here. This isn't going to come together really nicely. But this one's going to vote on the coffee cup and maybe something different. The side of a marker feels different from the yeah, side yeah, of the yeah, coffee yeah, cup. Yeah, I could yeah, go. You can yeah. take this where you want. The point is they're they're voting on there is a coffee cup at this particular location and orientation relative to me. Puff transform, there is a, uh, a circle at this particular location, orientation, and radius. Yeah. Uh, but they, isn't, that, uh, isn't, that, isn't the possibility here super, super large? I mean, how could this physically work? I mean, each of these input columns here could be saying, oh, well, there's like a zillion things that match me having this little rounded edge out here. Yeah, and and so you're you're because the space you're mapping onto is a space of objects and positions, mm -hmm. which is a huge space. How does that, yeah? How would that work? I think the system needs other clues to help it have some initial narrowing. In context from that location, the objects that are already present, no present in that location. I don't know. I'm reaching my hands to the black box and I grab something. With one finger? No, well, one finger we don't have a problem. Wouldn't that be really hard with one finger? No, because one finger you have to move. So yeah. the whole point we're trying to get around here is the problem we're trying to solve. I, I'd say the is, problem exists for both. Uh, it's not like one well, finger. Well, we know with one finger this, there is a solution that works. The solution that works is you by moving that one finger and integrating over time, we will resolve the problem. You don't need a classroom to do that. You, the case you were just making, though, that there's an immense number of objects at locations and edges and these unions are going to be huge. That also applies to those one thing. Okay, maybe, but it doesn't require a classroom. <laughs> um, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, good point. Um, uh, the problem we were, okay, so there's two problems here, but the problem we were trying to get at here, Jeremy, was that the issue that I can reach in and grab something in one sensation, and, um, uh, the, and, and yet, you have these different inputs on your fingers, and you are able to determine the object without movement. Um, you, you do have to move your finger if you just use one finger, but if you have enough contact with this thing, you can figure out what it is in one contact. And therefore, the answer to that, you have the, the, the configuration of your fingers relative to this object and those features is essential. So there had, that was the problem that was being solved, trying to solve. Mm -hmm. um, it's equivalent to a one finger with motion problem, isn't it though? I mean, you could say you have one finger, you, you're making predictions and you're moving twice and you get three inputs or three fingers all at once. Yeah, but in that case, in that case, the fact that you're moving, you, um, the fact that you're moving, you, ha you, can, you can have hypotheses about your location and as you move, all those hypotheses get updated and then you eliminate them. Yeah. So the movement itself eliminates the possibilities. We don't, that is the solution, the basic solution to one finger. You have, you generally have to move, and that eliminates, that narrows down the union of possibilities. Here, we have no movement. You have a union of possibilities, and we have to have some other mechanism which, which somehow relates these guys to each other. Uh, if, the, if you're dealing with the retina, the problem doesn't seem so bad because with the retina, all the retina columns are moving together, so they're, they're a fixed relationship to each other. Here, these are independently moving. So this is like the worst case scenario, I think. Uh, you have independent sensors which are moving somewhat in independently. And, uh, and so you don't know what parts of the object are on, and, and you don't know how to integrate them. So, so I think the idea that Marcus is trying to get at is you, you, how, do you, how, do you take, how do you take advantage of the relative position of fingers through body sense or body knowledge, and that solves that problem, something like that. Um, and Mark just made the point that even when we touch a single finger with a single finger, uh, there's like an infinite number of possibilities that could be matching at that point. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so I've, I've brought up ideas here that, like, I don't know if I'm going lunch. Looks like I'm not. Uh, so um, our, our voting, our multi-column voting, uh, here, I'm just trying to draw this really quickly. 
uh, three columns, some claustrum thing, claws thing. Uh, that it's probably not the claustrum, it's just that's the placeholder, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where I put it yeah. for, the, for the audience. <laughs> uh, so um, th the idea here is, okay, okay problem statement. Uh, if we use the union's approach, literally every cell is going to be active or something like that. Uh, and these unions will never narrow. Yeah, I think the solution just might involve the, the thing I talked about on Monday. Um, or was it on Friday? I can't remember now. Uh, the thing I talked about where I no longer view the problem. It's, it's like, remember I said the, the problem we have to solve now is a single sensor that's, that's moving, you know, changing its, its angular position. And that the idea of moving your finger over the object is 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 is, is sort of the that's that's like the nearsighted eye that has to go to different positions. Uh, it's not like you're just sensing a, a point. Uh, you're sensing part of a substructure here. I was leave it at that. The, the argument I made earlier was last week, I guess, but it was maybe on that about the, the difference between um, um, the, the think about the problem now is. Right, right, right over here, this thing here. This is really the problem, and this is a, uh, a sort of convoluted um, extreme end case, corner case of it. And that the, the real system here, you're trying to, if, you, if we solve this problem, then this one will come out. That's, I'm going to argue it. So I, I think that's, the, I'm going I'm to just hand wave and say, I think that's going to be the solution to the single finger problem. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyway, we still have this problem. Okay. I was just going to say, you get these other clues, like for example, these long-range connections are basically doing a bag of features. In our and current, in our both, in the yeah. way we've described it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm just saying that, like that, that gives you some information that can do some narrowing. Oh, on its own. And, and, yeah. and that might be enough to cause the system to finally take hold and, and do the rest oh, of so the narrowing. Somebody goes like saying these guys together say, "Hey, there's only a few things in the bag of features that really make sense here." Yeah. That would be a pretty big narrowing down. Yeah. Um, and now that I've narrowed that down, then I go back to Mr. Clostrum here, yeah. <laughs> or Mr. Body, or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a good idea. I mean, the general idea that you would have multiple these multiple different ways of doing this uh, narrowing down inference happening simultaneously. So you've got the voting, you've got the movement, you've got the the common rep reference frame how to transform. You know what to call that? All right, we did. I think we should uh, stop right, now. So, okay. Next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Are we good? There's good to have a LinkedIn research meeting. I don't know why. Are we up? Um, just a moment. Yes.